welcome. And all of you who are following online, we have thousands of people following this around the world, to the very start of the UHC Pavilion. This is an annual tradition now, where at DevX we host a series of events about universal health coverage. And we like to think we're helping to push the UHC agenda and the UHC conversation forward every year at this key UN General Assembly week. And we do that with all of you and with incredible partners. And for this session, our partner is the Sabin Vaccine Institute. I wanna thank them for joining us in what I think is gonna be a critical conversation that we're gonna get many of you involved in throughout the day. You know, there's been a lot to feel good about in global health, a lot of great progress and innovation, but we all know there's been tremendous backsliding, especially during this pandemic. And the numbers are kind of staggering. I think we've seen 25 million children miss out on life-saving vaccines in, in 2021. It's the largest sustained decline in childhood vaccinations in about 30 years. And the question is, what do we do about it? And I think this room and many of the people following along are exactly the people to start pushing and moving us forward. And that's the discussion we wanna to have today. How do, we, how do we get out of the situation we're in and find a new path forward? Now, it's gonna be a challenging thing to do, but we wanna start with the communities. We wanna begin with where community leaders and community groups can help to drive real demand for vaccination. Instead of starting, although we're all here in New York, at a place like the UN General Assembly, right? So we have to keep that frame in mind throughout the conversations we're having today. We'll keep coming back to that theme. Uh, we're gonna talk about things like trust today. We're gonna talk about misinformation. We're gonna talk about infrastructure and healthcare workers. Many of the themes that, that you all are working on every single day, we're gonna, I think, illuminate those issues to a new level this morning with your help. And I wanna just begin with a, a short video. We're gonna hear directly from some of the groups that we're gonna be talking about today. So please start the video. Global leaders should invest in supporting research that generates information from communities, with communities, about what works best to boost their demand for vaccination and their uptake. When it comes to vaccine acceptance, a lot of the conversation is dominated by vaccine hesitancy, often placing the blame on individuals and communities who are not coming forward to take the vaccines. However, the work in our research shows the opposite. The people from the communities that are under-vaccinated are willing to take the vaccines, but there is a lot of mistrust, misinformation. That we need to be not only uh, innovative, but we need to continue to bring the vaccines closer to the population where they are, whether it's door-to-door -door vaccination, whether it's vaccination at work stations, whether it's vaccination at religious gatherings. The informal healthcare worker, which were ignored the most, they were the one help us the most, and they were the one mobilize the whole community and make and generate the demand of vaccine and make the people to accept the vaccine. If you don't strengthen the trust in the institutions and in the healthcare workers, how do you expect that vaccines can be properly delivered? And how do you expect to increase the vaccination coverage? So instead of creating short-term solutions, we need to think in long-term structural solutions. To increase the vaccine uptake, uh, I would request the global leaders to involve a community member from a marginalized community. I would like to call about more involvement of nurses in the public health sector, mainly in the vaccination program because they have more closest uh, to the local communities and because they uh, will make a huge impact uh, well, when they need the programs. There's no one size that fits all. Um, what could work in the north could not work in the south. You know, so we need to really start working together with these communities, identify trusted people in these communities to work with. Governments, policymakers, need to make sure that everyone has access to vaccine, regardless of where this person stays or even lives, regardless of this person's social standing. You would like every child, every adult, every youth that is eligible for a vaccine to receive it and benefit from the, the most of the vaccine. 
to, to drive those benefits because the vaccine saves life. It is so nice to see you. It's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Now, you have many titles. I'm <laughs> going to try to get them right. You're a special envoy with the WHO. You co-chair the ACT Accelerator. You co-chair the AU's uh, Vaccine Delivery Initiative. So I would also add maybe a professional rabble rouser to that <laughs> list, if that's fair. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> help us get started on this theme. It sounds like there's a tension being built here in this video and in this session. And the tension is around, where do we put the blame for this backslide? You know, is it right to say people are hesitant um, and, and sort of it's their fault in a sense that they're hesitant for taking vaccines? Or is there some systemic failure? Uh, maybe a failure that even points at some of us in this room. H how should we think about this problem of, of creating real demand at the community level, at the patient level, for vaccines? I think um, I wouldn't go to the blame game. Um, I think there's plenty of blame to go around. But if one were to point to one specific issue globally at the moment, it would be that trust factor, which we heard over and over again on the video. We have seen that trust has been broken between, you know, it's almost we almost have a social, a breaking of our collective social contract, I think. And what COVID has done over the last two and a half years, it, is, it has shone a light, a, a very, you know, it's, it's put that magnifying glass on it and it's showing the cracks and fissures in our society. So when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, which I don't think is a problem, I think the problems are more systemic. But when we talk about the fact that we're seeing a backslide in vaccinations, it is reversing all of the gains of the last 15 or so years. We're seeing, you know, measles outbreaks in countries like Yemen, Nigeria, Somalia, Ethiopia. Um, you, you, you begin to, see, when, when you put those things together, you look at, you know, the 25 million children who don't, haven't had vaccines in the last year, didn't, were not vaccinated. There's common threads that you begin to pick up that show what is happening. And some of it is, I believe, is that we have now a, a nexus of conflict, of crisis, of, of COVID, we, of economic um, crises around the world. So it is, it's very simplistic to try and make it about hesitancy. It is much more multifaceted and much more um, multi-layered than that. I mean, some of it is very logical, right? Things like mass vaccination campaigns couldn't happen during lockdowns. Is there a chance that maybe we'll just see a bounce back? You know, that this was a, a moment in time that we did slip back because traditional approaches to vaccinating children weren't available, but now systems will be resilient, they will bounce back. Or do, we th do you think there needs to be some kind of new effort? Is there a new required uh, engagement by this community? We haven't seen a bounce back because things have started to, to return. And, and I think for me, as I, as I talk about it with my colleagues, I, of course, many of you know, I'm, I'm, you know, my voice and accent notwithstanding, I'm from Nigeria and I'm based in Abuja and um, in Nigeria. So, but my, my, my life and my career has taken me all over the world. I started life, um, you know, my professional life working in the Fiji Islands in, in the Pacific. And interestingly, had a conversation just yesterday with the foreign minister of Papua New Guinea, Juan Tokblomi, um, as we say in the language of the islands and talking about immunization, talking about the fact that they, as a country, country actually have one of the lowest COVID um, vaccination rates in the entire world. And, you know, why is that? And th that was an interesting dialogue um, because it, it countries that have done typically well with routine or um, essential immunization, as my sister Kate O'Brien, who I hope is here shortly, will, will, will call it for you, um, essential immunization have fallen back with COVID. And, and, and I think we have 
lost our way. We have we have tried to get too complex in the way we approach things. I mean, we're talking about universal health care here. We're talking about primary health care. And I, I think... We need to go back to the basics. Talking to the foreign minister yesterday, you know, yes, there's a lot of misinformation, but it's misinformation that is not being countered because as many of you who were at the healthcare worker meeting that um, some of us were at the other day, healthcare workers have lost trust in the system. They're not being supported. They're not being paid. So the mass vaccination campaigns that should have come back have not necessarily done so in the correct manner. The funding also has not been there. And we are, we are not going as local as we possibly can. I think it's, for me, it's back to basics, mobilizing the women in the communities and therefore giving them a livelihood, jobs, 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 pulling them into this, you know, to the value chain that we're trying to create. It's, it's not rocket science. You know, I was in Sierra Leone last week and I got to visit a couple of clinics and I was encouraged in one of the clinics, the community health officer there said they had reached a 70% COVID vaccination rate. And I asked, why do you think you've gotten to that point? And it's a quite a rural community, several hours from the capital. Um, and he said, well, partly we're just talking to the community about it. And partly we're scared because of our experience with Ebola. And that fear has driven some of this. And I wonder whether the, the experience we've all had with COVID might spur a new way of thinking about vaccinations. I know, again, the, the narrative right now is fairly negative. It's about hesitancy. It's about misinformation on social media. But is there some new leaf to be turned here, uh, given the experience we've all come out of? I absolutely think so. I think that there is an opportunity within this crisis. I think that the that, I mean, I'm so pleased to hear you talk about a rural community that reached 70% vaccination. I think we just haven't worked hard enough, um, really. I think I think we've been lazy. Um, I, I think at country levels, and this is not, again, it's not a blame game. I think there was a sense of complacency um, in, in the initial instance when we first stood up after the Africa Vaccine Delivery Alliance, we were the first delivery alliance to be stood up before we had vaccines. And we try to do the work across the 54 African sort of states. We try to do the work of readying the communities for the vaccine. And that involved going deep into communities and talking to people. But then back to this trust issue, once the vaccines didn't come and then we had the geopolitical mud fights between is it AstraZeneca or is it mRNA, people lost that trust. Um, that that was where the trust was 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 broken because people then started to think, well, am I getting something that is of of lesser value? The misinformation also from from sort of this media and and the the main both mainstream and social media. What we have seen with that is that it is it is targeted. You know, it is talking to again some of my Pacific cousins yesterday, last night, it was very much driven in the Pacific by the church. Um, it was very much, you know, I mean, the church that I used to attend in, in Fiji, I heard just the other day, has split in three over vaccination. But it's because of a lack of proper communication and a lack of information, um, true information, because we're all getting our information from these little, where, where's my phone, these little machines these days. And the information that is spilling around your countries, high income countries, is filtering down to people in those places. So where is that opportunity that I was talking about? You know, I'm looking right at Atul here and it's, you're actually stalking me at all. This is like the third time. <laughs> this third time I've seen you in like two days. Um, but, you know, the, the US government have, have, have done an amazing thing in the, the sort of the delivery funding that has been put out for delivery of vaccines. And, you know, I, I have, I mean, I was very vocal with, 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 with your previous administration and I, I will be vocal now, you know, give credit where credit is due that uh, there's been some good work done in trying to ensure that countries get what they need. Now, the funding for vaccine delivery, what is that opportunity? The opportunity there with the vaccine delivery for COVID particularly is to, leverage that funding and use that money to pay healthcare workers because it is the same woman. Let me use women as an example because also, of course, my other thing in life is about women in leadership and gender. So 
that woman who is going to go and do a well wellness check, a maternal and child child check, the, the 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 prenatal care check, the blood pressure check for the elderly. It is the same healthcare worker who is going to go deliver a COVID vaccine. Let us take these vaccines and let us use the funding that we have available to strengthen health systems by taking people to the communities, by getting mobile vaccination down to community level, by incentivizing healthcare workers, by recruiting more healthcare workers, community health workers, volunteers, by strengthening those little those little clinics or those little huts in, in, in communities that typically have no funding. We have this once in a hundred year opportunity to utilize, be it the fifth, be it whatever funding has been made available. So for me, I see an opportunity. And I think that we as a global community are not thinking creatively enough. We're still thinking within our little silos. We need to de-silo the whole thing because it's not just about vaccines. There's therapeutics and there's treat and there's and there's testing for TB and other other illnesses that we could wrap up into this and we could truly then see post covid that oh my goodness something good came out of this it's almost as though the, the please it's akin to how the vertical disease specific programs ended up becoming health system strengthening programs, but it took years to do, and you're asking for that to happen very quickly right yes. now in this moment. I think that's a great way to kick off our discussion. Please join me in thanking Yodi Alakija for her contributions this morning and for the great work you're doing around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're gonna shift now into a panel conversation. I wanna invite our panelists to join us on stage as we get some seats up here for all of you. Please come on. Uh, Dr. Furaha Kiesi, who's a pediatrician and a public health specialist with the Ministry of Health in Tanzania. We have Esther Nakazi, who's a freelance science and technology reporter, and Rashid Manganda, who is a nurse and maternal child health program coordinator in Southern Malawi, who is joining us virtually. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you very well. And and where are, we, where are you joining us from? So I'm joining you from Tanzania. Hello, everyone. Hello. So let me, let me begin with you, if I can, uh, Farah Kiesi. Uh, so we're, we want to talk about some of the barriers to getting communities to want to demand vaccines. And obviously, we've discussed a little bit in our opening session about misinformation and a lack of trust, a lack of healthcare personnel, even just paying healthcare workers, basic infrastructure. But what do you see in your own context from the Ministry of Health in Tanzania? What are some of the barriers to getting communities themselves to want vaccination? So thank you very much, Raj, and it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, discussion. Um, in Tanzania, we have uh, uh, different types of barriers. We have uh, <clears throat> those which we could say there's a health system barriers, and uh, also we can classify others as a demand uh, uh, creation or demand uh, barriers. And in terms of uh, health system barriers, there are few like uh, the way service deliveries are, uh, it has become a major challenge sometimes related to immunization services being available. Uh, uh, vaccines themselves, are they there? Are the services being uh, offered um, on a daily basis? We have seen that um, we tend to uh, do vaccinate more once we are doing what we call the outreach services as well as mobile services. But during cancellation of those services, uh, the coverage goes down, and that's one of the biggest barriers. For example, back in 2021, we had a, a cancellation rate of almost uh, uh, 20 to 30 uh, percent uh, of outreach services, which really sort of uh, 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 interfered with uh, access 
getting access to vaccination, especially at the different communities. Has so, uh, that, can I ask you, Farah, has that bounced back? Yes. That was 2021. Have you seen outreach services come back this year? Exactly. So what we are, done, what we are trying now, uh, now is we are trying to revitalize. We are trying to restore whatever has been a, has been a problem to become better and uh, well be defined and better well be done. So we are now revitalizing the outreach services, whatever that have been planned to be, to be, to be actually implemented as well. So we are in the process and we are still doing that as well. Rashid, maybe I can bring you into the discussion uh, as a nurse and maternal child health program coordinator in Southern Malawi. First of all, welcome. Thank you for being here. You've got a microphone right there behind you. Uh, what's the situation look like in Southern Malawi? Uh, how, how does it compare to what you just heard? Uh, thank you so much for the question and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, when I started practice in nursing back then, uh, vaccine uh, decision making and demand was different than now. Back then we didn't have uh, this mistrust that we're talking about. But uh, right now we have uh, 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 like a separation between the community and healthcare workers. Uh, health, uh, communities are not trusting the healthcare workers with uh, 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 any type of vaccines. So we started this approach uh, that we are integrating COVID-19 vaccines and uh, other routine uh, immunization. But then we started experiencing low numbers of women coming to access the routine immunization because we are combining the uh, uh, COVID vaccine and the routine immunization. So the hesitancy around COVID vaccines ended up creating hesitancy around the essential vaccines yes, yes, sure. because you were doing it in one program. Yes. And did you end up changing that? And yes, and then we, we, we got the recommendation uh, from the min ministry. We ended up uh, on changing that and we, we, we introduced the new approaches that are, uh, uh, seem to be working right now. Is the hesitancy around COVID vaccinations just as strong as it ever was or has it come down? It is strong and it's more strong right now. So I can give you an uh, example so that maybe you can understand how deep rooted uh, the mistrust is in, in, in our communities. So we, we have this uh, businessman uh, uh, from Palombe district in Malawi. So for those of you who uh, don't know where Palombe is, the pa Palombe is uh, one of the uh, uh, districts in southern, uh, southern part of Malawi. It is bordering Mozambique. It is hard to reach. Uh, 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 it is prone to disaster every year. We, we, we experience flood disaster every year in Palombe. It is prone to outbreaks. It is mountainous. And uh, we have free flow of people from uh, Mozambique to Malawi because it is border. Now that you, you, you have that in mind, I'll continue with my story. So this big businessman goes to uh, Mozambique to do business and stays there a couple of days, then comes back with food for the family. Yeah. And this time he went and he came back with uh, not only food, but also with anger. Yeah, he was very angry because uh, upon arrive, uh, arriving home, he found out that the, uh, his uh, one year old child was vaccinated with a uh, polio vaccine. So this, was, this followed after the, the uh, polio outbreak that we have, we also had cholera outbreak. So we are doing the campaigns for uh, cholera and polio. So uh, um, this time we are vaccinating all under, under five children. So we went to his house, we vaccinated the, ch the child uh, with the consent of the woman because he was not away, he was not consulted. Yeah, so he was angry because we vaccinated the child without his uh, consent. So he threatened to divorce the woman because uh, of or because uh, he read the child vaccinated without his consent. I mean, how could he? Uh, how could the wife consulted her whilst the wife had no phone and the mobile networks are different between Malawi and Mozambique? So there was no way he could. Uh, the woman could reach out to this guy, and then he didn't understand that fact. So he was furious. He went to the local authorities to complain the matter, and then the local authorities failed to resolve the, these issues. So he went further, he was referred to local police. And then the police called us the, as the healthcare worker. So we had to lift uh, the patients, we have to lift our works as healthcare workers to go to the police. 
and try to resolve uh, this matter. So we went there, we tried to give out the information, uh, necessary information about the vaccine, why we did, why we vaccinated the child, the benefits, uh, the benefits and all that. But yeah, he was, he was calm, but he was not confused. Uh, he was not convinced. And then we went back there, yeah, we, we continued engaged with him until he understood. Yeah, so this is how deep rooted the mistrust is in our communities. Yeah, that, thank you for that story. I guess going to you, Esther, is that is that what you're seeing as a journalist covering science and tech in the region? Is mistrust um, that deeply rooted everywhere, or is this an isolated example? I think um, as a journalist, there's there's a little bit of of distrust, and there's these trusted sources. They they are trusted people, definitely. When we, are, when we are covering news everywhere, like you do, we have people that the public trusts. And in our case, uh, the public trusts scientists more than uh, politicians. So, um, um, you know, when, when, when we are doing our work, we would, we would rather have people that the public trusts more who will amplify the message, who will show. So, for instance, um, as science journalists in our countries, we usually have what we call uh, media cafes. We do media cafes every month, and we have been doing this even before the pandemic, and we interact with scientists. So when the pandemic hit, it was one way of, it was, it was a continuous effort, really, to bring in the scientists, and they tell us about what the vaccines are doing and how they can be helpful. And because the public had always seen people doing this, these scientists talking to them through us, and we're delivering this information. So it was really easy to, to continue that, that, that thing, that, that, that effort. So um, it's, it's more of trusted sources. There was a lot of distrust at first because, you know, a lot of uh, uh, online news that uh, was bringing in misinformation from the West and, and, and there was an effort to fight the, the infodemic. But I think with time, with time, you know, people are catching up and they are, they are trying to trust, trust people. Yes. And when you're, you use trusted sources, you're a journalist. Right, which of course some of the people purveying misinformation are also using. They know who is trusted. Uh, you know, my own wife had an experience that got covered in the news media here where her mother refused to take the vaccine here in the United States. Her mother is originally from Colombia. And we finally got to the bottom of why is she refusing? And she shared a video that had a woman in a white lab coat who was presented as a doctor from El Salvador speaking in Spanish and explaining why you cannot take this vaccine and it's very harmful for you. And this was being sent around my wife's mother and her family and they wouldn't take the vaccine. It took a long time to convince them. And that kind of content is playing on this issue. Yeah. What, what about healthcare workers themselves? What about nurses? What about pediatricians? Do you find people in your audience trust them? People do trust uh, healthcare workers, I must say. Um, um, these people, I, I mean, they've been picking the, the vaccines. We, Africa is a, is a continent that has been vaccinating. We do childhood vaccines and they've been trusting them. And uh, for a long time, um, this is what has been happening. I mean, it's, 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 it's a routine thing. So they, there's, there's, a, there's trust um, to, to a certain extent, uh, but social media, came in at some point and there were distractors who were bringing in disinformation. And of course, that needed a lot of firefighting from everybody to come in. And the people who were sort of fi firefighting were the people who would be trusted. And some of them were the health workers. Faraha, I wondered if we can get your take on this, because as you started, you were talking about kind of infrastructure issues, right? the outreach campaigns, the mobile vaccination campaigns. Um, and now we got into listening to Rashid, the, the idea that actually hesitancy, misinformation is at the core. How do you see the balance from your perspective in Tanzania? Is it, is it more about people are concerned about taking the vaccine or is it more about stockouts in the clinics or just access? So, so um, 
as I, well, first of all, I want to recall the issue of trust, uh, especially the healthcare workers. They have been trusted. Tanzania is among the countries that has been are doing very well in, in vaccination and in terms of coverage. So issues of uh, 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 trust is there. The thing that came up with issues of myths and misconception, as you're giving the example. So there are a lot of myths and misconceptions that came out. Healthcare workers did not have much knowledge so that they can also communicate the very same knowledge to the community. And that's where the hesitancy that came in. But once they, got the, once they were well-educated, well-oriented uh, on issues of uh, vaccines, especially the COVID-19 vaccines, then things started moving up. Uh, Tanzania is among the countries that have really uh, gone very fast in terms of coverage, in terms of uh, improving uh, the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines. Once the healthcare workers, once the community, especially in terms of um, uh, what we call the uh, community health workers and social mobilizers, once they got the, and once they understood uh, the meaning behind the vaccines, especially the COVID-19 vaccines, a good message was going there. So it was only issues of or, uh, knowledge, I'd say. Rashida, you know, in my conversation with Yodi, she talked about the need to take this opportunity to invest in healthcare workers and in healthcare infrastructure. Are you seeing that on the ground in Southern Malawi? Are you seeing more money flowing to healthcare workers, more hiring of healthcare workers, more investment, not just in vaccines, but in the broader health system? Yeah, uh, I would say uh, my ministry is investing a lot in healthcare workers. Uh, it has recruited a number of uh, healthcare workers, nurses, clinicians, in response to COVID-19 in general. So uh, in terms of uh, recruitment, it is happening on the ground, but maybe exposing these healthcare workers, they need to have the platform like that I'm having right now. They need to be heard. They have stories down there, the challenges, but they are documented because they are not heard. So they need to be given the platforms, you know, to, to be telling the challenges that they are facing. What, what are some of those challenges? Just give us a sense. Yeah, uh, for example, we, we have a uh, lack of inf infrastructure for our community activities, as Fra has pointed out. We also, uh, or, uh, we don't have uh, access to transportation to move around to uh, our communities. As I said, uh, many of the districts in my country are hard to reach, and we, have, we will always use motorcycles to go to, you know, to go to the communities. But most of, of the times we, we, uh, we don't have the fuel to use. Sometimes we end, we end up, you know, walking, carrying the cold chain boxes to go into the communities to deliver uh, uh, these vaccines. So I think we need a lot. Uh, we also need uh, like uh, uh, the accommodation for healthcare workers. Uh, like in Malawi, we, we, there's a policy that community healthcare workers have to stay in the communities where they work, but there's no accommodation for them to stay uh, yeah, in those communities. So it is very challenging for them to be, you know, staying somewhere far, and then they have to travel to the communities to provide uh, health services. Esther, I want to get your take on the moment we're in. We talked about this a little bit in the first conversation. Um, it's a crisis in terms of childhood vaccination rates, no doubt. The numbers are far below where they should be. Do you think we're getting out of that? Do you see that this is kind of a, a downturn related to things like supply chain issues and the inability to do outreach campaigns during lockdowns? Do you think COVID is changing behavior, changing attitudes in, in a potentially positive way toward investment in, in health infrastructure. What, what, are, what, are you, what are you seeing as you cover these stories? Yeah, I think that there's, that there, there was a downtown, the, the, the number of people, the, the number of vaccines uh, that were being taken on by childhood uh, vaccines went down, but there are factors to that. I mean, in Uganda schools were closed for two years and uh, that's basically the place where most uh, children, most girls get their vaccines. So it, it was inevitable for those, for those numbers to come down. But like um, the uh, Dr. Uh, Ayoade said, there is an opportunity. We all have an opportunity now. We all have a duty to bring these numbers up. And we have the global community here now uh, in the UN 
to call upon and, and make them act. Everybody has a part to play. The journalists have a part to play. We, we all have a part to play to, bling, to bring these numbers up. And, and because there was, a, there was such a huge gap, everybody felt it. We all feel it. Misers are killing children in, in, in parts of Africa. And, and that used not to happen. So if we give the right information as journalists, if the, uh, the leaders can find the gaps and, and the vaccines available, everything will be fine. So there's an opportunity, yeah. Uh, everybody has a part to play and we can, we can totally fix everything. I'd like to th th take that as your final comment and get a final comment from our other panelists as well, if I could. Dr. Faraha, maybe what, what, is, what is a message you want to leave our audience with on the current situation we find ourselves in and how we get out of it? So, so uh, personally, I would like to say we need to really instill and maintain public confidence as a healthcare workers. We really need to do vaccinate, whether it's children, whether it's the adults against COVID-19, but we really need to do that to avoid the outbreaks that are, we are starting to see them. As uh, my colleague from Malawi has mentioned, we have now a polio in uh, Malawi and Mozambique, but also measles are coming up. The other, other diseases that we had not seen them for the past 20 years, 70 years, might start coming up. So we really need to focus, we really need to say in one voice that vaccination uh, rate, vaccination has to go up. Over. Yeah, fundamentally, that's what it comes down to is being able to see those outcome measures and know that we're moving the needle in the right direction. Rashid, some final thoughts from you. Yeah, uh, what up? What I've observed in my country, we have people that are willing to get vaccinated, but they don't just feel the need uh, to get the vaccines because they don't have uh, enough information, because maybe the approach, the strategies that we are using are not working. So uh, uh, we need to be flexible enough to, to introduce the approach, uh, maybe the strategies that can work to reach out to these people. For example, we, we have the big organization like UNICEF that are assisting with uh, our vaccination activities in Malawi, but maybe the strategies that they want us to use, they don't work in Malawi. So it is not one size fit all, that uh, maybe it is working in, in Rwanda, the same can work in Malawi. For example, uh, we were using uh, the, uh, what we call Finish My Vio campaign. We also used uh, 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 Vaccine Express those are strategies we are not working. Now that uh, we introduced the new approach, which we call vaccinate my village, we go door by door to reach out to the people. So this vaccine has proved to be, you know, working, has materialized. So we want uh, the organization to be flexible, to come to the ground, to discuss with us the approach that, uh, you know, that can work in our setting, yeah? Because we know the people that we live with we know what they believe in. So in that way, maybe we can be able to get a lot of people uh, vaccinated. And also I've observed that women in our settings, they don't have the say uh, in decision making for maybe uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, the vaccines uh, to, to their children. Yeah, I'll give, uh, I have already said one example. I'll also say another example of uh, a healthcare worker. Yeah, as I said, we had uh, a polio uh, vaccine campaign so it was like we wanted to finish this campaign in one week. So we divided in two teams and it was flat out. We went to different locations. So my team went to a house of a healthcare worker who has gone to the other village to do also the same vaccination. So it was shocking uh, to hear the wife of this healthcare worker who has gone to uh, other villages to vaccinate the children of other people saying that uh, 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 her husband has instructed him not to have the child vaccinated. You can imagine the healthcare worker is vaccinating other people's children. He doesn't want uh, his, ch his child to get vaccinated. So the wife was willing to have the child vaccinated, but he was afraid the, uh, uh, the husband said no. So I feel like women do not have much say uh, uh, regarding health of, of their children. So I think we can do more on that one. We can empower women to have say regarding on their uh, on the health of their children. It's such an important point to, to end this discussion on because it shows the value of taking a community first lens 
to this problem as opposed to let's say a UN General Assembly lens where we might come up with a one size fits all solution. Certainly some of the resources, the commitment does have to come from an, a gathering like this, but in the end you have to tailor the solutions to what's needed at the community and their voices have to matter, which is why this panel has been so valuable. Thank you so much to all three of you for joining us today, Dr. Faraha Kiesi, Esther Nakazi, and Rashid Manganda. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. So this has been exciting already. I wanna get your take on some of what we've heard and to dig a little bit into the kind of stereotypes, misinformation um, that underpin the issue of vaccine demand. Uh, I have with me here, Dr. Anant Ban, who's a mentor and principal investigator with Sangak, and Stacy Nobler, who's a vice president for vaccine innovation and global immunization at the Sabin, at the Sabin Vaccine Initiative. Thank you so much for being here. What are, Stacey, let me just start with you. What are, what are some of your impressions from the conversation that you just heard? So first I'd like to thank um, all of the, the individuals that were willing to, to share in this discussion and DevEx as a partner to highlight it. Um, I think for us, what this is a real reflection of is the critical commitment that Sabin has made um, to the work that we're doing really to look at this from that community perspective, to work with our partners to identify um, what those key challenges are. We've heard so much about how the solution really needs to come from the community. Um, and, and it's that work that we're building, that we're doing, and not just to sort of understand the challenges, but then really try and figure out how do we take that new understanding and move it into a place where it is going to be actionable, where it's going to, in fact, create change um, and, and create um, uh, opportunity um, for driving impact and really delivering um, on the power of vaccines. Let's talk a little bit about that, the how how do we actually go about this? So if we have an insight that we need to be community driven, we need to listen to the community, listen to the healthcare worker, how do we turn that into policy or program at the global health level? So I think part of it is recognizing that we need to bring those voices to the fore. I think you you know you mentioned in closing um, that it's very easy for sort of that that top down approach to persist um, because so many of the resources from the donor community continue to sort of trickle down from above. Um, there really has to be a commitment, um, a new commitment that's made to thinking about how we challenge those investments in a way in which we give voice to shaping those investments um, at the national level, at the subnational level, and at the community level. So we need to build systems that are going to allow those voices um, to emerge. Anand, what's your, what's your take on this? How do we, getting a little further into the how, how do we actually challenge these stereotypes, the misinformation and change the dynamic at play? Sure, thanks Raj. So, you know, um, in our work at Sangat, we uh, have been working with ASHA workers for many years. So ASHAs are frontline community health workers, one million strong, um, have been around for many years now and are the last mile uh, delivery professionals in India. We've also been working with Sebin funding uh, with marginalized communities, specifically transgender persons, persons with disability, to try to understand what their experiences have been in trying to access COVID vaccination. So just by way of example, I would like to think that there are two issues. One is a design issue. So if you work with marginalized communities, you know, sometimes we have vaccines available, but they might be available at facilities. But when persons with disability try to access vaccination, then these facilities might not be really designed for individuals with disability to go in. Uh, you know, they will sometimes be carried into these facility, which is, of course, not, not in line with their own dignity. Um, there are pictures taken of them, but then, you know, no planning of actually taking the vaccines to these communities. Uh, the second thing is sometimes, you know, you have pers transgender persons who might not have identity cards, but the only way you can get an appointment for vaccination is you need to have a formal um, identity card. So, I mean, these are design issues which can be solved, but for that, we need to recognize that each community might have a different need and we need to respond to that. 
The second thing is one around recognizing that we've not done adult vaccination of this kind at scale ever, right? And, you know, you see pictures where vaccines are being taken to communities. Sometimes individuals are being chased in their agricultural fields because you want to get their vaccine numbers high. But why is it that they are reluctant sometimes? You know, If you've never had touch points where the health system has reached out to you historically for many years, uh, where health needs have never been responded to, and you suddenly have a vaccination program where everyone is coming to you and trying to cajole you into getting vaccinated, of course people will have questions, right? Uh, it would be the same with any of us. So I think we need to recognize that there have been historical uh, issues with the way the health system has reached out to communities. If we try to engage them, respond to their concerns and work with them, I, I see a more long-term partnership developing because COVID vaccination is going to be the first step. I think if we need to get new, more newer vaccines out into the communities, then we need to really understand these concerns and respond to them. Are you seeing the global health conversation start moving in that direction of being kind of more patient-centric, understanding especially marginalized groups, why they might not have access? Yeah, so I think marginalized communities are now becoming stronger. They are also coming out and speaking about their needs. And this is in line with something which the disability community has spoken for historically, which is nothing about us without us. So none of us actually should be speaking for them. You know, we should be providing the stage to them. And hopefully some of these conversations as they uh, keep continuing will have more and more representation from marginalized communities. But it's also important for those to, uh, concerns to be responded to, acknowledged, and acted on. It's not enough for us to clap when someone says that these are the issues. It's how do you take that feedback in designing better programs? You know, we've had huge successes in countries like India with vaccination, but the last mile still needs to be covered. And I think for that, we need to work with communities in cohesion. Yeah, Stacey, this image of a vaccinator chasing someone in an agricultural community is very vivid and certainly not the direction we want to go in. So what, what do you think about the challenges that were just described and, and how we might get, be, get beyond them? Well, I think one of the things that's become so much of part of the conversation more recently, um, and we're really trying to emphasize, is the importance as we kind of emerge and begin to learn from the, the COVID experience, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of the systems that, that deliver healthcare um, and the workforce that's part of those systems? Um, and really focusing on the idea that without systems that are resilient, without systems that have that kind of agility to be able to adapt as you learn on the ground. Um, we, we've heard a number of examples um, already in, in this discussion about how the experience is quite different um, from one community to the next able to respond to that. You also need a system that is going to deliver and not mention that part of the challenge in reaching people as it related to COVID was around the idea that these were not systems that had previously delivered for them. They were not systems that, that they had any faith or trust in. Um, and in fact, had probably failed them in some way previously. So if we're going to expect that that, that, that trust is going to be, that, that they're going to show up and, and they're going to be part of a system where they understand that access and attention to their needs is really built into the system, then we need to build um, a system that, that, that works across it. And central to that system is the workforce um, and really empowering that workforce. Um, they need to be empowered to take on the challenges of misinformation. They need to be empowered to be able to understand how to listen within their community, to think about how they change their programs over time. We, we heard that, you know, that if you start out and you were going to do COVID vaccination and EPI together, maybe that doesn't work everywhere. Maybe that's not such a good idea. You have to be able to, to understand, be empowered to be able to realize that early and then act accordingly. And so much of the conversation I think this community was having a year ago, year and a half ago, about getting these vaccination rates up in the low and middle income countries was supply driven. It was about how do we get the vaccines there? And then maybe belatedly realizing, well, getting them on the tarmac is a long way away from getting them in people's arms. And then we end up with stories like the ones that you've just described and on. I think we have someone here in the audience who is gonna help provoke the discussion a little bit more. Uh, nurse Amy Staley, are you with us? And maybe we can get a microphone over to you. I think there's one coming right behind you, right behind you. 
Good morning. These conversations have me thinking a lot and people love to ask nurses like myself, what is the craziest thing you've ever seen? And I usually do give them the Grey's Anatomy type trauma story that everybody wants to hear. But I have to tell you that after spending the last week with each of you, my answer has changed. The craziest thing that I've seen are the 25 million children that are missing out on life-saving vaccines. And the fact that we do have community health workers in places like Africa who are willing to work and save these lives, but the world has somehow decided that only 14% of them are worthy enough to get paid for that. New York is my community, not you and New York. <laughs> the single mom who raised me here in New York, the pregnant teens in foster care whom I used to care for, the nurses and doctors who never stopped, and all of you who deployed yourselves to help us. During UNGA, everyone shows up in blazers and pantsuits, but I want to see authenticity because I know that outside this fancy venue, each of you are human too. And I bet that when you saw that video this morning of Rose and Muhammad and Mapo, you, just like me, saw pieces of yourselves. It might be the craziest thing you've heard this week, but I believe that we in this room have the power to change those statistics. We have a lot of really great leaders over at the UN, but they aren't the people who be build our communities. We are. Next week, I won't be in a blazer. I'll be in scrubs and my patients will ask me how they are being represented in rooms like these and what we're doing to build back their communities. And I'm hopeful that I'll have a lot to tell them from the amazing leaders in this room who know what it's like to be human and to be humane. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amy. And I have to agree, looking out at many of you, this is a room that can change those statistics. Absolutely. Uh, as we wrap up this panel, I just want to get a, a reaction from the two of you and a sense for all of us here of what we should do going forward. So Raj, for me, I think you know there are a few things which are key takeaways. One is, of course, we need to build and sustain trust with communities, and that is extremely important. That requires long-term presence in the communities for that community health workers are our key agents. We need to support them. We need to pay them, pay them fairly. We need to ensure that they have uh, supportive supervision at all times so that they can maintain that trust with the communities and help um, us respond to their needs. The second thing I would say is that we need to really listen and partner to communities. Sometimes that doesn't really happen. Uh, we treat communities very instrumentally when we have a campaign, when we need to get our vaccines out. But Communities have valid concerns, and if we have pathways for them to voice that and for them to be able to communicate with us, then hopefully we can look at longer-term partnerships where communities are key um, in, in, in how we design our health systems. And finally, vaccination doesn't work in isolation. Vaccination has to be part of a large health system response. So let's not treat this as a vertical response. This has to be part of a larger reform where everyone is a key partner and, and we, we hear their voices repeatedly. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Stacey, some final thoughts from you. I think that as, as the pandemic begins to sort of fall off of the, the headline space, um, my plea is that decision makers, um, those that need to invest in making change at the global level, um, at the national level, um, don't think that the problem has disappeared. Um, there is a real opportunity now um, to take incredible lessons that we've learned um, from a very difficult situation and make sure that we don't put ourselves in a position to repeat it in the future. Um, there are significant amounts of investment that have been made in immunization systems specifically, health systems more broadly. We should leverage that. We should make sure that we don't lose that momentum um, that essentially has been generated. We know that we must not lose it because we have a lot of recovery um, that we need to address in this space around immunization and making sure that we're not only catching up all, all of the, the, the kids that, that we know have been lost as a result of the pandemic in terms of coverage, um, but recognizing that reaching those marginalized communities, those really hard to reach populations, we need new solutions, um, we need new opportunities. We've learned a lot, let's not lose that. Let's not get into that terrible cycle of sort of panic and then neglect as we move forward. Yeah, I agree, let's get out of that cycle and let's thank this fantastic panel for this 
this incredible conversation and for highlighting the importance of community. I think we can underline that word. You know, we think a lot in, in the global health world about verticals, disease specific projects, but community is this underlying factor that I think we're bringing to the, to the fore today. Please join me in thanking this tremendous panel. And I'm going to... And she's the host of our big conference on the West Coast every year in the Bay Area, Prescription for Progress, where she gathers the global health community and talks about innovation. The stage is yours, Catherine. Thanks, Raj. Hi, everyone. Well, we're going to be continuing this conversation on the role of communities and um, really unpacking something we hear often, which is working with and for communities. What does that really look like? What are specific examples? And what lessons can we learn from COVID-19 to build trust moving forward? So again, building on conversations today around community, around trust, but specific examples, a very solutions-oriented conversation in store. But I wanna make sure we get to the challenges as well. I'd love to welcome our panelists, two of us joining in person and one joining us virtually. So hopefully we'll see her here in a moment. Um, I'm joined by Dr. Atul Gawande. Uh, who perhaps needs no introduction, but he's Assistant Administrator of Global Health at USAID, and of course, a renowned surgeon, writer, and public health leader. Dr. Gawande, thanks for joining us. We're also thrilled to be joined by Dr. Amer Ikram. He's Executive Director of Pakistan's National Institute of Health, and thrilled you could join us, especially given the challenging circumstances in your country right now. We're thinking of all of you with the flooding. And joining us remotely here, we have Dr. Kate O'Brien. She's I hear myself echoing, there we go. She's director of the Department of Immunizations, Vaccines and Biologicals at the World Health Organization and previously executive director of the International Vaccine Access Center. Kate, can you hear me okay? Beautifully, thanks so much. Great, thank you for joining us. So I wanna go ahead and dive right in. Um, you know, COVID has taught us a lot. Certainly um, we've had many challenges when it comes to vaccination, many lessons learned as well. So when it comes to community engagement specifically, building trust within four communities, vaccination within four communities, I wanna better understand how each of you are experiencing this in your own role. And ideally you can tell us a story. What does this really look like? Uh, so perhaps Dr. Ikram, we'll start with you if that's all right. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, I'm extremely grateful for inviting me over to this panel. Uh, see, I mean, COVID has been a big challenge and uh, I keep repeating such challenges do bring in opportunities and it's our job to convert those opportunities into realities. And that's what, what, what we have seen, I think, as uh, just uh, pointed out by Stacey, there's a lot has been done and we need to mo move on uh, and base upon that, we build upon that as well. Uh, talking in part particular for a developing country like Pakistan, I think we launched a very robust system in the form of a national platform at the National Command and Operation Center, where all the stakeholders uh, got the opportunity to join hands together, whether public, private, and all those. I mean, from diagnostics to um, community engagement to um, surveillance, what and what not. And coming down in particular to the vaccination, we launched a system whereby uh, the national database system was involved. And uh, I mean, today, uh, if you look back, 90% uh, of the eligible population beyond 12 years stands vaccinated in Pakistan, which is quite, quite amazing. If you see the statistics and 95% is partially vaccinated. And this week we started off pediatric vaccine as well. Now, with, with, with all that in mind, I think the system that uh, I would say the risk communication and the community engagement played the topmost role. Definitely, there have been involvement of the religious leaders, uh, celebrities coming down into even to the level of president and prime minister of the country being involved. And that's what we have seen globally. You involve the community, the system definitely changes. And that really, really helped us. I mean, going down, we started off with the static uh, units, then we moved on to mobilization for the far flung area. And I think the best thing was the campaign that really helped us a lot in nurturing all across the country uh, for the vaccination. So indeed, I mean, uh, coming back and then the statistics uh, uh, pointing down for the informed policies and uh, a very formidable uniform policy for communication. And definitely we, we heard a lot about the social media. Uh, it's been it's been definitely quite a lot to talk about, but definitely positive of time doesn't allow. So with all those hesitancy or the negative uh, influencing, countering them uh, through robust mechanism, that played a very, very important role as far as uh, we are concerned. And I just wanted to state for those who aren't aware, 
Pakistan, like so many countries, saw a steep decline in routine immunizations over the course of COVID. But now um, the country has actually surpassed pre-COVID-19 levels of vaccination due to some of these strategies. Of course, I'm sure the flooding poses new and unprecedented challenges, and hopefully we'll have time to talk about that as well. Um, I want to go ahead and bring Dr. Gawande into this conversation. Um, so first, I just want to start with the question of trust. I mean, trust has come up time and again today, and will continue to do so. Uh, and it's always a central issue. So when we talk about what it really looks like to build and sustain vaccine demand within four communities, trust is central to that. But can you talk through, it's an obvious point and yet it's not happening. So what are examples of it and why is it not happening more widely? So a couple of things, I, I'll, I'll start with the story of um, getting to visit in, in uh, Ghana where we've made major investments. Uh, the United States has deployed uh, well over uh, almost $2 billion going to supporting deliveries, delivery and messaging and uh, and not just getting vaccines to the port, but actually getting them into arms. And in Northern Ghana, in two of the states that have tended to be some of the toughest, most rural environments to get vaccination going, um, we found that they were able to outperform many of the other regions uh, simply because we had partnership with the government and implementing partners who had relationships in the community already. And they were building on that trust. And then before the vaccinators arrived, uh, people who were known uh, were arriving in the community who'd been there before, community health workers, connecting with religious leaders, connecting with the local village leaders. So that, and they would say, here, the vaccinators are coming. Here's the problem that they're seeking to address. And they got to 50 and 60% vaccination rates in communities that were below 10%. Um, we, and you had other, uh, other areas and regions where it was below 20%. Part of the story here is, is exactly what the previous panelists were referring to. If, if this is the first time you're engaging in communities, that is not how you build trust. And, the, um, and there's a paper that came out in The Lancet uh, about two weeks ago that I thought was very powerful. The first thing it noted was that democracies did in fact outperform autocracies and do tend to outperform autocracies when it comes to health and survival. But Democracies with low levels of trust did no better than autocracies. Democracies that had high levels of trust in the function of government or in leaders, and just higher, I mean, trust is eroded everywhere, but those who had uh, the higher levels of trust, nonetheless um, uh, outperformed by a, a large margin uh, behaviors around COVID, not just vaccination, but mask wearing and other kinds of um, uh, suggested um, uh, so the, the key I, lesson from that is this is not specifically about vaccines. This is about um, uh, the nature in which our public dialogue and our governments are able to build the trust that they are there on behalf of society. And there are uh, deep ways in which changes over the last 20 years have uh, frayed some of that trust that is part of the rebuilding. Mm -hmm. And one quick follow up question for you. Um, health workforce has also been a big emphasis of today's conversation. Um, and can you just speak to, in terms of what's coming from the administration, I know the proposed uh, Biden-Harris administration health workforce initiative points directly to some of what's been discussed today. So can you help us connect the dots between that proposed effort and getting vaccination back on track? So, so this is in the context of something that's critical to understand is that in the last two years of the pandemic, we have experienced the first reduction in global life expectancy in a century. What I'm telling you is that every year we've had progress on child mortality. Every year we've had progress in human life expectancy across the globe, year after year after year for a century. And the setbacks that have occurred are only, especially in the low income and low middle income worlds, only partially because of the effects, direct effects of the virus. The, the majority of it has been uh, effects on health workers who no longer were going out to communities in the same way, fear of people coming into health facilities, economic declines where the health workers were not paid necessarily anymore, 
they were not necessarily protected and they feared going to work themselves. And then you add the deterioration that occurs as the food security problems are, have amassed as uh, inflation or economic decline has occurred in a variety of places and health budgets were cut. So those workers were not protected in the same way. When I was in Nigeria, there were strikes in um, uh, because workers hadn't been paid in some of the states for uh, three to six months. So the the, the critical thing to understand is we will not regain, this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery because of the damage to the health systems. And the damage to the health system is actually damage to health workers. When health workers are paid, when they're paid on time, when they are have adequate levels of training and are integrated into primary health care systems, those are the places that have the highest levels of routine immunization and things can work. Uh, when we were in Nigeria, we found that there were three states that had sustained and dra dramatically increased their routine immunization rates in ways that other states had not. And one of the things was it was the mundane task of making sure that the budgets were passed and moved in such a way that the workers were paid on time, their medical commodities and vaccines for routine immunization were in place, and they were able to make dramatic improvements that didn't occur elsewhere. Just the last thing I'll say, to my colleague, Dr. Ikram, I mean, one third of Pakistan is underwater right now. It's almost a landlocked country. And uh, and my administrator, Samantha Power, described going out on a helicopter and for four hours with nothing but water everywhere. Mm -hmm. 33 million people displaced. We thought 10 million after Ukraine was terrible. This is just devastating. And in the midst of this, you have continued to launch in the dry areas. You've kept COVID vaccination going. And that has continued. Yeah. And we're working together to field routine immunization and address what we know will be a major polio setback. And so the fact that during COVID, you regained routine immunization is because of that trust yes. that you've built across your country in, that, in, the, in reaching out. Yeah, I, I, thank you so much. I would like to highlight this. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think uh, this has been an amazing story. I mean, learning out of COVID and then moving on. Uh, during the first uh, uh, definitely wave of, of COVID as uh, uh, internationally, or globally, what we see was the uh, total lockdown in the country. And that was a setback because be just before that, we were having almost 92% of BCG vaccination, around 85% of uh, Penta, around 80 plus percent of other vaccines. That was really going with a huge speed and a sharp dip down. But we immediately recovered with a very robust technology and we definitely uh, got the community involved. And that's that's the area which helped us a lot. We went down, we had a top, um, rather than having a top bottom, we have a bottom to top approach whereby the civil uh, society organizations were involved, most of which were already involved with UNICEF and all that. And definitely to the dedicated areas we target, which were hard hit. And along with that, uh, having the community representative, we have, uh, be, beside that, we have the lady health workers. Uh, they're doing amazing jobs. So we utilized all the services together and we immediately recovered for the routine immunization. And, and that's how what we think is this experience taking on uh, to yet another hit uh, for the country, uh, which is almost one third is inundated. But I think it's 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 a challenge you know, after challenge. We have we will take our experience from COVID. We'll, we have used it for the routine immunization, and we'll definitely will fight it out. We are having tough time, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ikram. We're really fortunate to have your perspective today. I want to bring Dr. O'Brien into this, and you know we're hearing these amazing stories from Pakistan about uh, responding to the challenges not only from COVID nineteen but now from the floods. Um, I wonder if you can speak to you know, to the extent we're at a turning point, and it seems that we are in terms of uh, understanding what does and doesn't work in building and sustaining vaccine demand with and for communities. If this is a turning point, what lessons do we need to leverage in order to build trust moving forward? And how are you in your work with the WHO working to make sure we actually apply those lessons? Thanks so much, and what a what a great honor it is to be on this panel with uh, Dr. Ikram, Dr. Gwandi. Um, all of you in the room, apologies that I can't be there in person. Um, there are a couple points that I want to make, and I really love the storytelling also about uh, what we're learning because, you know, there is this saying, of course, that all politics is local, and um, we know that the P in public health actually refers to politics also. But I think, uh, I think it goes without saying that all community engagement is local. 
I think one of the biggest things that we've learned from COVID-19 is um, things that we've said before, but we didn't do. And that is that um, we have to design the way that immunization programs actually deliver vaccines to put the people who are supposed to and need to and want to get vaccinated at the very center of the design of those. And that means we've seen so many changes in the way the system is working and deploying. And what Dr. Ikram just described is a, is a great example that um, in COVID-19, we learned the really bitter lesson that the vaccination has to happen at a time and a place where people can access the vaccines. So this means that we've gone out to places where vaccinations were never happening before. Apart from polio campaigns, we didn't have house-to-house -house vaccination campaigns. And yet we've seen that in, in quite a number of countries. We've seen vaccinations in markets, at transportation hubs, at bus stops, at bus stations, um, in, uh, in market places where um, adults uh, are going about their daily business. Most people don't wake up in the morning and the first thing they think to themselves is, boy, top of my list is um, how I'm gonna go out and get uh, the vaccine that I'm supposed to get today. So anything that the program can do to make the um, availability, the sort of visual triggering, the opportunity for people to get vaccinated as easy as it possibly can be um, is, is I think one of the things we've really learned. Mm -hmm. The second thing we've really learned is that um, people are busy. They have a lot of other things that are, are uh, top of their minds. Uh, especially in communities that are uh, communities and families and, um, and, and people who are um, really at the poverty level and living in fragile um, and vulnerable settings. And so the, the critical thing is that they're getting what they need, not only the uh, vaccines that we um, hope that they want, uh, especially for kids, for adolescents, for pregnant women, but they're getting other services uh, that are things that are really critical to them and that we're actually um, providing those services in times and places, but also providing them together. So when a, a mother and a father may be immunizing their um, child, that they're also being offered um, services that they need at the same time. So I think we, there's been so much talk of so many of these things. They're not groundbreaking ideas, but they were and have been groundbreaking implementation because the only way to actually be successful has, has been things like this. Um, so one of the stories that I just wanted to bring here is um, we've had such a long opportunity and effort to um, really live out that vaccines are across the life course. They're not just for kids. They're not just for infants. They're, of course, for adolescents with HPV vaccine, for pregnant women, for healthy adults to continue the protection that they've had from diseases that they can still um, uh, uh, suffer from as an adult, if not protected, and now older adults. And yet we haven't had a platform where older adults really are um, an age group that we engage through vaccines. So in Mozambique, a really great example of um, Help Age International that brought solar powered radios um, to rural communities so that older adults had access to community information, to information about vaccines, um, and were not sort of left on the margins of uh, being able to access what, what was an opportunity, what, what the times and places were. And these are some of these sort of critical community communication interventions um, and opportunities that actually lead people to get what it is that they, they do want and they are demanding. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. So I'm left with one question, but alas, we are also out of time and uh, it is my job to turn it over to audience Q&A, but I'll leave our panelists with this. I know some of you have pre-existing commitments and have to go, but Dr. O'Brien mentioned there are things we've said, but haven't done. So if any panel calls for a final call to action, I feel that this one does, you know, what do we do? What's one thing you want everyone to do? So uh, I, I don't want to go over time, but maybe very, very quickly, Truly a sentence, one, one thing you want to make sure we do, and then we can build on it further in audience Q&A. Dr. Gawande, do you want to start first? I know you might have to jump in a moment. Uh, the U.S. government, we, the, the president has put forward a uh, proposal to Congress not only to make sure COVID-19 and monkeypox uh, is financed, but that we are uh, putting money into stopping the backsliding on routine immunization, and that would be our one thing to do. Make sure resources go now for uh, backing routine immunization. Thank you. Uh, some applause for that. Dr. Crum. 
I think um, uh, health is now being a security issue. We need uh, for vaccination, we need uh, uh, equity and justice. And that's what the message is. And so everyone gets the equal opportunity. And we, we need to invest. We need to invest in research of the vaccine. We need to invest uh, definitely in order to save the humanity. I think we have heard about ECTA doing a great job. We WHO doing a great job. COVAX doing a great job. So some way, some way we, with all the learning coming out of this, transforms COVAX into a sort of a globivax where it remains there, it serves the globally, and definitely be ready for any other pandemic that comes, God forbid, in future. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. O'Brien. Yes. So my uh, one action is for governments to treat vaccines and vaccination as a life-saving intervention, not a routine service. Hmm. Um, and for me, what that means is fully funding um, with security on a year-in, year-out basis, the commodities and the health workers who deliver that service and all of the program elements that go along with it. Thank you so much to our panelists. Really appreciate, again, unpacking what does with and for communities really look like and how can we see more of it? So thank you all. And I'll hand it back over to Raj. quickly. We're going to have a rapid fire Q&A. And if anyone in the audience has a question or a comment that they'd like to share, this is the moment to do that. So raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you quickly as our panelists make their way back up. And uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Who in the audience wants to get us started? I'm going to come join us on stage too. Yodi, please join us. Join us. If you're, if you're here as a panelist and you're willing and available, come on stage. We, we want to hear from you. And, and I want to give everyone in this audience a chance to, to share their own views and their own questions. Who wants to get us started? We'll take a few to, to get going. OK, we've got one over here. If we can bring a microphone there, please. Who else? Any other? Anyone else? Oh, and one there in the back. We'll take two or three to start. Go ahead, please. Just tell us uh, your name and your organization, and you can make it a question or a comment. Just keep it brief, please. Sure. My name is Lucia Diaz-Martin from CRI Foundation. Um, I've heard about uh, vitamin A supplementation being affected by uh, the drop-off in routine immunization. So I was just wondering if any of the panelists could mention if there's any other of these sorts of uh, negative consequences in other disease areas that you could speak to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Let's see. Uh, I think there was one there in the back there. You can get a mic over there, please. Raise your hand one more time so they can see you. And while the mic's getting to you, we'll start with someone else right here in the front. Go right ahead. Is this on? Yes, okay, go yes. for it. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Waugh with IMA World Health, Course International. Um, and I realize this is a broader conversation about vaccines in general, but but with COVID-19 vaccination, I'm just wondering if there's any different perspective or words um, in differentiating the misinformation, disinformation barrier versus the complacency barrier that I think um, we're also seeing that people are just not seeing the validity, the need that it's not a priority. Uh, is there anything different we do about that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead in the back. Yeah. Hi, I'm Svea Klosser from Johns Hopkins. Um, so, so wonderful to see the emphasis on paying community health workers and living wage. And I'm just wondering if any of you have ideas about ways that we can work toward actually achieving that. It's been a challenge to get donors to get those kinds of recurring funds, of course, and governments don't always have the enormous resources required to do that. So any thoughts on what we can all do to achieve that goal? Thank you. And we're going to start with those, with those, uh, and I'm going to give you Yodi a microphone as well. So any of the three of those, we don't need to get to every single question. You don't all have to comment. We're going to do this rapid fire. Uh, but we talked, Lucia mentioned vitamin A. Are there other areas where we're seeing a drop off? Uh, Rebecca talked about the complacency versus misinformation. Maybe that's one for you to tackle, Yodi. Um, and then Sonia from Johns Hopkins was talking about how do we actually get pay to these CHWs and community health workers. 
Well, I'll speak really quickly because I have to speak at another event in just about 40 minutes. Um, I, let me speak with to community health workers and pay first, actually. I think that is um, a critical, critical area that we need to put pressure on governments um, and also donors to fund community groups, CSOs. I can speak from personal experience at leading the Africa Vaccine Delivery Alliance, which I've done now for the past two years from the Africa Union. And every single proposal that came from the CSOs within that group that were people at community level doing community work that would have provided livelihoods at community level was not funded. But those proposals were then we presented them, my colleagues presented them to various, many of you in this room, you know, various foundations and what have you. And the exact same work has been appropriated and is now being done by others because they're international NGOs, which means that the money stays here or in the UK or what have you. So we have to fund, do things from a financial perspective. We have to find different funding mechanisms so that we can ensure that people at the very bottom of that level get get paid. And very quickly to the disinformation um, question and, and misinformation, I, I, I mean, I think it is very different for different contexts. So for the UK, the US and, and other sort of high income, the global north, it, it, it's, there's more choice here. You know, in, in the, some of the examples that we heard today, for instance, in, in other countries in the world where there's only one vaccine and they have heard weird and wonderful stories about that vaccine that are largely trickling out of bots coming from here or other parts of the world. Uh, I say that there is no vaccine confidence without vaccine equity. And that means that there needs to be choice, there needs to be availability and accessibility. And without dealing with that, I don't think we can begin to speak about disinformation or misinformation being what is creating the quote unquote hesitancy. And with that, thank you. Thank Rob. you. Yeri. What about complacency? Uh, is that an issue? Do any of you want to jump in on that? Is complacency an issue here? Maybe I'll take it on mm -hmm. first because yeah. um, actually in some um, some other work just this morning, we had a discussion um, as part of work that we were um, a part of to, to address this issue of low risk. Increasingly, there's, there's a, a decreased perception of the challenge of COVID. Um, and that's real. I mean, we, we've made a lot of progress. We've had a lot of success. So people, um, it, lockdowns um, are, are, are gone. Um, but at the same time, I think what it does is it puts the onus back on the public health community. And that's the public health community everywhere. At the, at the community level, um, at the national decision-making level, and, and again, from the, the global donor community, um, to, to think about how we message, to understand how we take on that challenge and say that, that immunization um, as a whole is an incredibly protective um, uh, intervention uh, across sort of the health profile of any population. And that includes continuing to protect people from COVID. Um, it's not just about individual protection, but it's about community protection. That has long been the, 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 the sort of discourse that we've enabled around immunization, but we have to stick with that. We have to remain, um, uh, I think, vigilant um, in talking about it. We also have to be aware of the different priorities that exist in different spaces. In many cases, it may be that COVID-19 may not be the, the most important priority. If you're experiencing an outbreak of another disease, whether that's typhoid or it's Marburg um, or, or it's measles, um, those are the kinds of things that, again, this gets back to that notion of agility, being agile, not just with our systems, but with our messages and how we communicate um, as well. Anand, I wonder if you have a take on Lucia's question about other areas that have had a setback, right? We heard, we're we focusing a lot on immunization here. She talked about vitamin A. Anything else you can add to that list? Yeah, I mean, because of the protracted sort of attention to COVID, uh, we've seen this happen in multiple sectors. A good example is TB, where a lot of TB diagnostic machines were repurposed for COVID because you didn't really have a lot of testing facilities. That's also happening with malaria, with the reproductive and child health, with the whole lot of other suite of interventions. In fact, there were tertiary care hospitals, which were entirely shut down and converted to COVID care um, institutions for many, many months. So, of course, we are going to see a lot of 
pent up care requirements, unfortunately, some morbidity and mortality as well. So this is the time for us to recognize that if we need to be better prepared for future pandemics, we need to rebuild the health systems to be more resilient so that we are able to respond to uh, unique uh, challenges such as emergencies, but yet keeping core interventions running and not disrupting them. Ahmed, I, I would love to get your take on the question about paying healthcare workers, right? We seem to have this challenge where donors, for political reasons, understandably want to fund vertical programs, disease specific. But at the end of the day, we're all in some level of agreement that you need the basic infrastructure at the ground level, and that includes healthcare workers. How do we square that? challenge. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, just morning we were having a discussion about the verticality of the programs. I, I think it's good. I think we have experimented a lot. But now is the time for whether talk of TB, we, just about malaria, we talk of HIV AIDS, we talk of hepatitis. I mean, these programs have to be horizontally integrated. And their utility becomes much more. Uh, recently, we had a discussion with Ianfi as well on this uh, very important topic. And I think it needs not deliberation. Uh, even going down to polio team in, in our country, I mean, unfortunately, the man is, is still not over. And uh, those teams have been thoroughly utilized. But definitely, there was a vertical program which was being paid for. For the rest of the team, definitely, it's the donor, the partner, and the government joining hands, uh, uh, in particular for COVID. We utilized all those teams, going down to a great work done by the lady healthcare workers. And see, the, um, and I must praise the women. I mean, there's a lot of confidence in our country for the ladies going home to home. So, so that that's that's very so. These are the powers, and I think we need to utilize these powers to make it happen. Complacency? I don't think so. There's been a lot of learning which is being translated into meaningful future, as I said. Pandemic, pandemic, and pandemic, and then the preparedness plan. I mean, we need to remain committed. We need to have a solid communication, and that makes the difference. And there we are. I mean, last, uh, uh, you talked about definitely, I think some of the things that our mother and uh, child nutrition did suffer in developing countries. If, if I see back in our own region as well, that's the area which uh, got neglected. And I think time has come when we need paid more attention to this area. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. And you can pass the mic to Rashid, who I want to give a last word to if you would like. Uh, no, you're fine? Okay, thank you though. And, and please join me in thanking this incredible group who's come from all over the world to be with us today, including those who have joined us virtually like so many of you. Uh, we, we do need, unfortunately, to close out our session, but I want to invite William Asiko, who is a vice president for the Africa Regional Office of the Rockefeller Foundation, for his quick reflections as we close out the session. William, where are you? Come, come join me on stage. Please take a microphone. So you've been listening to this, I think, very dynamic, inspiring discussion. What do you take away? Uh, thank you, Raj, and uh, thank you, DevEx, and our partners at Sabin for giving us this opportunity. Um, obviously, coming at the end and trying to offer reflections is difficult because, you know, a lot of great uh, conversations have been had here, and there's a lot of great content. Um, perhaps I'll focus on three things that you know, maybe weren't given that much attention, or at least I didn't hear that much uh, in terms of and coming to this from a very African perspective, uh, because that's where I spend most of the time in communities, with policymakers, uh, and so on. There's been a lot of talk about building trust, and I think everybody agrees that that is important. Um, but I have to say that I agree with uh, Dr. Gawande when he said that this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery. The idea that we are going to build trust to the same levels, pre-pandemic levels, I think is a challenge. I think uh, social media is here with us to stay, especially echo chambers in social media, here with us to stay. What we're going to have to focus on is building trust issue by issue, tackling situation by situation. And the best way to do that, I know that we've heard that there's a lot of trust in healthcare workers, but I would challenge any healthcare worker here who's from Africa to say that they have time to go out to communities to build trust. They're very busy people and they're really, really stretched. In Africa, we have to rely on community health workers. Uh, and we heard from Nurse Amy, I, I completely agree with you, that it's a tragedy that community health workers are not part of the professional cadre. 
within uh, ministries of health and other health departments. And that needs to be rectified. And if there are you know, um, development partners, uh, we just had a discussion about not looking at, at this horizontally. We really do need to professionalize the community health workers. Many of them are volunteers, and many of them could change the face of how this trust issue is, is dealt with. So that's the first point. The second thing is I think that it's very important to recognize that uh, you know public health officials and public health departments are not going to be able to do this on their own. We have to be able to build partnerships uh, that go beyond the public health arena uh, in terms of, and particularly if you look at COVID, uh, COVID vaccines in particular, you know, we have seen some very, very strong partnerships with faith-based communities, places of worship, schools, places where people are, meet people where they are. You know, we, we've talked about hesitancy and uh, skepticism, but the fact is that, you know, if you tell people a vaccine is going to be in a place uh, at a certain time on a certain date, and they go there and they have to wait three hours for it and it doesn't come, you know, they're hardly likely to go back. All right. So, so logistic partnerships to ensure that, you know, logistics is, uh, is not an issue, you know, should be looked at. And again, these kind of things do require funding because public health departments just don't have the resources to, to establish such uh, partnerships. And then finally, I, I think we have to find a way to share learnings because there are pockets of success. Uh, and we've heard some stories here today. There are pockets of success, community by community, country by country. We've got to find a way to share uh, those learnings with peers. So peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, under the Rockefeller Foundation, we have established what we called the Vaccine Action Network, uh, which today is uh, four countries, but will expand soon. And what we've seen is that if you bring peers together from different countries, they learn things that worked in one country, and then they said, oh, you know what? That can work in my country. It sounds simple, but it is such an effective way of getting uh, build, you know, solutions to, to move much, much uh, quicker. Um, you know, between peers, between countries, and between communities. So I think those are the three sort of reflections that I wanted to leave everyone with. I think they're important, and I think that we've heard people skirting around some of these issues, uh, but those are the things that I, I think would move the needle forward. Thank, thank you, right. Thank you so much, and please join me in thanking William Asiko. I want to say a lot of what William has just described, I think, is the ethos of this event and this day our partnership with Sabin Vaccine Institute that brings this event to life. And I think the inspiration that many of you have provided, certainly to me, I hope you walk out feeling inspired, as bad as the numbers are, there's incredible people working on this issue and working around the world on this issue and hopefully today learning from each other. So the day continues, you get a break now, but there will be programming back up on this stage in just about 20 minutes. So get some food, network, meet your friends, enjoy yourself, and thank you for being here. Thanks everyone.